Please open your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 6 as we read verses 6 through 10 today. Please rise as we hear God's holy word. Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. I got the book right this week, right? I'm doing, okay. Let's hear God's word. Let the one who is, is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. This is God's word proclaimed in your presence. May you have the ears to hear it. Please have a seat. He's not one of our better known presidents, but Ulysses S. Grant has a few stories. He's, of course, a guy who had all the scandals attached to him. I could only imagine what the news cycle would make of Grant today. But there was a particular account that happened that I was drawn to that in the late 1860s, Ulysses S. Grant had a good friend named of Horace Norton. We don't name enough kids Horace these days, do we? Horace Norton. So Norton was the founder of Norton College, and uh, one day, Ulysses S. Grant was meeting with them and said, I would like to give you a gift. And he gave Horace Norton a cigar, a cigar from the president. And Horace Norton knew he could never smoke this, right? This is a gift from the president. So he put it in a box and he put it up on his mantle and he would show everybody and tell everybody. And when his son got old enough, Horace Norton gifted it down to his son and said, I want to pass along the cigar that's from the president. And when his son got old enough, he had his own son, and he said, I want to give this to you. And so he passed down the cigar to his son as well. And so it came to pass in 1932, when the grandson Norton got up at their college to give a great speech. And the topic of the speech was Ulysses S. Grant. And so as he's doing that speech, he says, I got something very interesting, that in our family, we have this cigar that was handed down to me from my father and from his father beforehand that was given to him by President Grant. And as he's giving this speech, he said, I'm going to light this cigar, I'm going to smoke this cigar, lit the cigar, and it exploded in his face. You see what had happened? Was that Ulysses S. Grant wasn't giving a gift, he was pulling a prank on his friend. Gave him an exploding cigar. You know, a cigar with just a little bit of gunpowder in there. So that we, you know, and, and apparently the, he was expecting his friend to smoke the cigar. It didn't happen. It took three generations for the truth of that cigar to come to life. The truth of that prank to come to life. Ulysses S. Grant, wherever he is, probably got a little bit of a laugh out of that. But it's called the law of harvest. And you've heard this. Non-Christians know this one. What you sow, you will reap. It's a law of the harvest. Well, Paul says here, what you sow in your life, you will reap in your life. He begins to draw this letter to a close. We can kind of feel Galatians winding down. And Paul is getting his final words in here, his final teaching to this church, what he wants them to remember. And so he says, guys, I want you, I want everybody who reads this letter to think of your life like a garden. What you plant is what will grow. What seeds you put in will reap long-term consequences, whether those are good or bad. And a maturing Christian needs to think like this, that we don't just live for today. The world lives for today. We're all about instant gratification. What I can do for me now, what benefits me now. Paul says, have a long-term view that you're looking for the harvest, the harvest that will take a long time. So we need to be planting the right crops. We need to be thinking about what we're putting into our life now so that later on when we reap, it will be a good harvest and not something we will regret. Well, speaking of gardening, every, 
I, I have this memory burned into my head that every Saturday morning growing up, we would do two things. We would wake up and watch cartoons, because that was a thing back then, kids. You know, we watched cartoons Saturday morning. But then after a certain time, my mom would say, okay, guys, turn the TV off. Let's go to the garden. And we'd drag our feet because the fun was over. The gardening had begun. And we would get out there, and we, we learned to hate weeds. And my mom would say, well, that's part of the curse, right, from Genesis. And we'd be like, yes, mom. We hate, we hate weeding. But we would work the land, so to speak. I, I became a farmer, and my crop was always really sad and pathetic. But what we learned was whatever seed we put into the ground, and my mom would say, like, these are tomato seeds, these are zucchini seeds, and we're like, let's throw those out. Nobody <laughs> wants zucchini, right? These are cucumber seeds. And my mom would say, whatever you plant in the ground, that's what's going to grow. You don't plant tomato seeds and get strawberries. Something's really bad has happened if that's the case. You always get what you plant. Well, this is, a, this is a very simple agricultural truism. Paul knew that almost everybody back then grew something or knew people who grew things. And so that's why he seizes upon this. He says, look, just like with tomato plants, whatever you're planting in your life is what's going to grow. And you shouldn't really be surprised when it does. I think a lot of people are because a lot of the seeds we plant are very sinful. We plant sin seeds in our life. And we may say, well, it's just a seed. It's just a tiny thing. It's just a thing that nobody else notices down low. You know, I, I forgot about it this time. No big deal. I'm just going to plant that. It's like ingesting just a little bit of poison. I'll probably survive. I'll carry on. Well, it's deceptively easy to think that what we do doesn't matter at least until the seed grows. Paul says we can't fool ourselves. In fact, we can't fool God. He says God will not be mocked. You might think you're really good at hiding up your sins in your life. And I, you know, I don't see your sins unless you come confess them to me or I see you performing them. I have no idea what your sins are. But God knows. He sees every day. That's why when we do this confession of sin together, it should make us bring us to such a humble state to realize God sees. I mean, I, 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 it brings my heart down to think of that. God has seen every sin I've done in the past week. What will those seeds grow into if I don't get them out of my spiritual garden? We need to be careful of those small sins because those secret transgressions do have a tendency of coming out at the absolute worst time in our life. And that harvest will become nothing but a corrupted mess, Paul says. That's something sin never wants you to do, by the way. It never wants you to really think about the long-term consequences. Just think about the now, what you can do to please yourself now. Don't worry about that. That's borrowed time. That's in the future. Well, farmers, I'll tell you what, what? farmers spend a lot of time thinking about the future. When they go to plant their crops, it's not, you know, let's just get a bunch of seeds and scatter them everywhere and hope for the best. They study weather tables. They study fertilization. They, they go to seminars. What's, what's trendy? What's hip? They look at land viability. Is there land ready to be, to be sown on again? But all of that planting might come to, to nothing if the farmer gets bad seeds. And that happens every now and then. They'll get a batch of seeds and I don't know if you knew this, most of the seeds that we plant, that farmers plant, ha have to be bought by them. They can't reuse seeds. The seeds, they're, they're, they don't, they're not reusable in, in the field. They're like, they're, they're just genetically, um, yeah, trademark stuff, so they have to get it. And so if they get a shipment of bad seeds, those seeds not, might not even grow. Or if they grow, it might be like a stunted crop, corrupted. And they have to throw everything out. And that's their livelihood. That's where they get all their money from. That's what we don't want. We don't want bad seeds in our life. Over the last couple of months, we've been going through Galatians. And we've seen how what we call a couple of bad seeds have planted in this church. Just a couple people at first. A couple of people coming in and saying, you know what, this, how you're practicing is pretty good, but you know there's a better way to salvation a way that we Jews have been practicing for a long time that involves the law. And, and suddenly those, those couple of bad seeds 
starts sprouting, starts spreading, and suddenly the whole church is withering and is dying. They believed in a faulty gospel, and it changed everything for the worse. And suddenly the Christians have these bad seeds in their life. Their spiritual garden is withering. And that's what Paul has been addressing here in Galatians. We need to be careful of that ourselves. That we, need, we don't live, as Paul says, to the desires of the flesh. No matter how tempting it is to always satisfy yourself sinfully. To let loose in anger. To let loose in things like greed and lust. We need to be careful of what plants in our heart because it will grow. Because it will grow at the worst possible time. What are we planting? What do we need to get out of there? We need to, I know it's not fun to go in and weed your garden. I didn't like doing it in real life. And I don't like going into my own heart and saying what is planted there that I need to get out. Where Jesus used that metaphor where he said, if, if your left hand causes you to sin, chop it off. He's, he's saying, take extreme measures. Not that extreme, but take measures to get sin out of your life. Do you have an accountability partner? Do you have somebody you can go to and confess your sins to? Not that they'll sit in judgment of you, but they'll help hold you accountable. I'm struggling with this sin. I need you to ask me next week, have you sinned again? Knowing somebody that they're going to ask you that suddenly helps you to really get rid of some of those seeds. We need to be careful what sinful seeds are planting in our lives. But the good news of this law of harvest, it's not just bad seeds that produce bad crops, but also good seeds that produce an amazing harvest. And that's what Paul goes into saying in verse 8 here. He says, listen, there's a course that will take you to give you the most purpose you've ever had in your life. And he says this, the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That continues a theme that Paul touches on again and again and again in all of his letters, that what you do now for Christ echoes through all eternity. You live for eternity. I had one of our neighbors down the street came, came up to the church on Friday, said one of your signs flew down like months ago, and it was one of our signs that said live for eternity. She's like, have it back. You know? I'm like, oh, thanks. You know, like, appreciate that. But it's a good reminder. We live for eternity. It gives a lot of weight to our actions in our life. That we're not, tomorrow isn't just Monday, yet another Monday where I'm going to go through the same routine that I always go through, and what I do doesn't really matter unless I get a paycheck or I check some boxes off on my to-do list. No, tomorrow is a day the Lord has made. He has prepared it for you. You can go out and do things for Him. You can sow to the Spirit. You can love other people in his name. You can do your work to the best you can possibly do for his glory. You can love other people. You can read his word. These are all ways that you can live tomorrow for eternity. And God will remember because things that are done for God in the approval of God will be remembered by God. He will remember these things. He will bring them up to you later on. Paul says you will reap life. If I have a choice between reaping corruption and reaping life, what sounds better to you? I want to reap that life. I want to reap something that matters, that lives not just temporarily, but lives forever. Wouldn't it be great if you cut some of those beautiful flowers that are now growing out of the ground and you put them on your kitchen table? And what if they just lived forever? They were always beautiful and they always were fragrant because what our flowers end up doing, they end up wilting after a couple weeks. That's not how our actions will be seen by God. Forever fresh, forever remembered, forever honored, forever rewarded. That's why Paul is so excited about it. But the only problem here is I can tell you that tomorrow is a day God's made for you. Get out there, live for him, and you might turn around and just say, but Pastor Justin, I'm tired. And I get it, because I am too. Sometimes we just hit that wall. We are exhausted of doing good. Living for yourself is supremely easy. You don't ever have to have somebody come up to you and say, I want to really encourage you to live for yourself this week. Yeah. Take it easy. Really enjoy yourself. Pamper yourself. Just make yourself as happy as possible. You never have to tell somebody that. But to tell them, go live for other people and go live for God, 
Sometimes it's like, you know, you're pushing the donkey inches by inches through the muck, and they're like, I don't want to do it. It's hard. It's exhausting. It wears us down. Sometimes we just find ourselves emptied out. What do we do then? Because living for God and others can be tough. Well, it makes me think of my very first car. You have your first car? What was your first? Just call it out. What was your first car? All right. You don't forget your first car. Hopefully. Maybe you do. Maybe you've had so many cars. I've had six in my life. I can remember all six. But the first car was my first car. It was a special car. It was nothing extraordinary. It was a 1992 red Ford Tempo. It had almost nothing in it that worked except the wheels and the engine. It was one of those, you know, I had to crank the window down kind of thing. Tell kids that these days. We didn't just have a button that made the window go down. You had to get, you know, we, we built up some muscle back in those days. My 92 Ford Temple, I loved this car because it was my first car. Nothing in it worked. Probably the worst thing that didn't work was the fuel gauge. Because the fuel gauge would go down about halfway and then would just always stay there. I ran out of gas three times my first year in that car until I got so I wised up and I started refilling that car every other day. Because I'd never had an idea when my car would suddenly, unexpectedly just out of gas. But isn't that how we feel sometimes? We never really know in our life when that, that energy gauge for God will suddenly bottom out where we're, just, we're, ex- we're out of gas, we're out of that energy to go out and do good. We just want to be selfish, and we just want to kind of just sit at home. I don't want to do this anymore. Do I get to say that on Sunday mornings? I don't want to preach it. I want to just go sit in my office for a while. No, we can't do that. But it happens to us Christians. We get exhausted of doing good. So what do we need then? We need to fill back up. We need to get refueled. And that's what Paul is here to help us do in the verse 9. He says, when you feel like this, when you, you don't see immediate results, or you're experiencing setbacks, or you're just drained of the Christian walk, you need a refueling. Now this pep talk he gives us in verse 9 is a very short one, but I think it's pretty meaningful too. He says, don't give up doing good in your life. No matter how much you may want to at times, don't give up because there will come a day where all of you done will be seen by Christ and God will say, let me go over all of the things you have done for me in my name and I will give you your harvest. I will give you this. I think it's enormously helpful for us to feel when we are drained, let's look at the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ he had to be exhausted. I, said, I think sometimes we see, well, he, he had his divine nature. But yes, but he also had his human nature. And day after day, he's preaching to the masses who don't get it. He's got 12 disciples that are bickering and arguing, and they don't get it. He has people always wanting things of him. He has the, the, the religious leaders coming against him, trying to oppress him. He has satanic attacks happening nonstop on and around him. Jesus was exhausted. And a lot of times when he's just exhausted, what does he do? He goes off by himself to pray. I think a lot of those prayers were simply, God, fill me back up. Give me the energy to get through tomorrow because i got to get back out there and they need to hear the word. He never gave up doing good to the people even when he became weary. I think that's an encouragement to us. We need to get fueled back up. We need to have those pep talks. We need to look at the scripture and see what the scripture has to say in encouragement. You want a longer pep talk than verse 9? Go to Colossians chapter 3, where Paul says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not things that are on the earth. For you have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appeared, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Set your mind on things above. It's a shift in perspective, isn't it? 
Stop looking at today. Stop looking at just what you could do to make yourself happy today. Look at the big picture. Look at the long term. Look at that harvest that's coming down that is promised to you. The crown of life that you are running that race we talked about a couple weeks ago. That you are desperate to reach out and grab and seize that Christ is ready to give to you. The Bible assures you there was a day coming where every single good thing that you've done in the spirit will be harvested and blessed to you. He will not overlook a single thing, not a single thing you've done for him. So who do you do these things for? Well, that Paul addresses in this last little bit here. And we need to look at three different categories of people that we do good for. And the first, in verse 6, is a call for believers to share resources with the one who teaches them. In other words, pay your pastors. Pay your pastors. I feel a little uncomfortable right now. I think every pastor does. When you get up and you're like, well, I don't really want to preach. Oh, this is very awkward. This is, it sounds very self, uh, that I'm out for myself here. I'm not. I, I want us to look at this because, first of all, Knox, you treat me well. Don't worry about it. You guys, are you can breathe a sigh of relief. This is not a guilt trip. This is, let's look at what the scripture says here because Paul says, you need to pay your pastors. This is a very important thing. Ministers of the words do not need to be super rich. We don't go into this line of, of uh, our vocation and calling to get ourselves Lear jets and golden yachts. But rather, what Paul wants us to see is that it's a sign of a healthy church that wants to support the minister so that the minister can, in, re in return, teach faithfully and not have anything holding them back not having other responsibilities or other financial pressures that keeps their time away from really doing the work of the gospel to the church. Right now, I looked this up this past week, 28% of the pastors in our country are bivocational, that they have to have a second job so that they can afford to be a pastor. 28%. Now, probably a lot of those are pastors in very small churches that really can't afford a full-time pastor, and so they have to do that as a matter of course. But that limits their ability to be a pastor. I had a good friend here in Western Michigan. He moved away a couple years ago, but he was in our denomination. He was bivocational. By day, he worked for Ford. On the weekend, he worked for God. And it was hard. He was also always expressing how hard it was because his office hours were limited. If somebody needed to talk to him, somebody needed counseling, he would have to do it after his, his job was done at Ford. And he always felt like he was being pulled in two different directions. And so Paul is encouraging us here to pay our pastors, to support those doing ministry. And not just pastors, but people on staff are missionaries. We know from reading Acts chapter 14, that when Paul and Barnabas were going around and they were planting churches on their missionary journey, that each church they would plant, they would appoint an elder, they would appoint a pastor over that church. I think it's a very interesting question to ask, and I have not asked it to this point. Nobody's come up to me and asked, where are the elders of the church of Galatians? Where are the pastors? What's going on? This church has really had such a, a horrible situation happen. Where are the pastors who should be teaching, correcting this false teaching? Where are they? We don't know. We don't know. But we can infer something. I think we can infer from verse 6 here a possible scenario. That the church did not support the pastors. And the pastors left. And that, that left the door wide open for these false teachers, these agitators, to come in and say, we'll take over from here. We'll start spreading. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that's a possible scenario. But just imagine, that's one of the reasons why we want to support fully the ministers of the word that are faithfully preaching the word of God so that we do not leave a door open. Well, that's the first category of people we want to do good to is the ministers. But also, Paul says in verse 10, the second group is everyone. Everyone. Well, that's kind of broad. Thank you, Paul. I'll get on that. I'll just do good to everyone. Well, yes, I w we are to love our neighbor, right? That's a, love our neighbor as ourself. Our neighbor isn't just the person next door to me. Our neighbor is everybody on this planet and orbiting the planet, anywhere else that might be. 
We are to love our neighbor through acts of goodness and mercy as much as opportunities arise. God gives us chances to serve others. And each one of those chances is a seed that you're planting in your spiritual garden. You do good to somebody else, that seed will have a harvest. What if we said yes? Just imagine this. What if every opportunity God put in front of you to help somebody else, to forgive somebody else, to minister to somebody else, every single opportunity in your life you said yes to? Because we don't always, right? Sometimes we say no. I'm too tired today. I don't want to. I don't like this person. I'm not going to do it today. God, I did five things yesterday. I can take a day off. We don't always say yes, but what if we did? What if every single time we said yes? There was a 2008 movie called Yes Man with Jim Carrey. I don't know if you've seen it. It's okay. But it was an interesting idea that this guy one day said, well, I'm going to say yes to everything everybody ever asks of me. Now, that really leaves the door open to you being abused and, and, and all this stuff. And so it's not a very practical thing. But it was really interesting to see over the course of the movie. Again, I'm not giving it my recommendation. There's some questionable things in that movie. But it was interesting to see how him saying yes started having some very positive effects in his own life. He helps a stranded homeless man. He starts to reconnect with lost friends in his life. He starts blessing a lot of people because instead of that knee-jerk reaction of saying no because I want to live for myself, starting to say yes because I want to live for others. And that's what God does for us. Do we say yes when God puts these opportunities in front of us? Because he's going to this week. It's going to happen. It might be your spouse. It might be your friend. It might be a stranger. And you'll have this opportunity. Sometimes it'll be a split-second decision. Do I say yes to them right now, or do I go on my merry way? Do you say yes? What happens when you do that? And thirdly, the third group of people that Paul says we do good to is the church. Christians are to help everybody, but Paul says that we give special priority to people in what he calls the household of faith. Why? Well... Because this is in our club. This isn't a social group that we get together once a week and we eat some snacks outside and we put up with a boring guy talking for a while and then we get to talk a little bit more. This is not what we're here to do. We are a family. We are a household. We are gathering together with our family. Family comes first and we are led by Jesus Christ. And so Paul says this, <coughs> sorry, this is what gets priority in our life. That when we do good, we do good for our family. We, in church, it's here that we find our identity. We find our security. It's where we come to, to fellowship with other people who believe what we believe and worship who we worship. It's where we learn and we teach the gospel. This is where we do a bulk of our ministry is in and through the church. So we need to be doing good for the church. We need to be giving of ourselves in the church. Do you have a ministry in the church? Do you have something you are doing for the church? Maybe that ministry is, hey, you're filling up some of those Easter eggs right now that Barb was very, uh, very good at handing out to all of you guys. That's doing good for the church. Singing music, doing tech, a lot of these things you're doing for the church. But maybe you look at all that and say, well, God's now asking me to give to the pastor and give to everybody and give to the church. And I'm, if I wasn't going to be emptied out before, I'm certainly going to be emptied out now. I'm going to end up broke and destitute. And I'm going to be out on the street. And I'm going to be doing so much stuff for other people that my own life is going to be miserable. And that's a, th that's a line of thought that I think enters into a lot of our heads. That we might become so generous that we empty ourselves out and our bank accounts out. First of all, I don't think that ever happens because I've yet to meet, and I've met a lot of very generous people, but people have truly emptied themselves out to that extent. But if we did that, would we become that miserable? I don't think so because Malachi 3.10 tells us a different story. It says, when you bless the church with your tithe, when you give... When you open up your hand and say, God, take this. Use it for your ministry. Use it for your people. Use it for your church. Use it for other people. God turns around and Malachi 3.10 says, then he opens up the, sto the storehouse, the floodgates. 
I saw a video the other day of a dam that was opened for the first time, the floodgates of a dam that hadn't been opened up for years. And at first you don't see much, just a little bit of mud trickling down. But the pressure of all the water ends up shooting out before long. And it was just, I mean, it was shooting out like a half a mile. That's how much water pressure was stored up. And that's what God is saying. You think you're, you're giving too much when you give a little bit of a tithe? I will turn around and I will open up a flood like you've never seen. A flood of blessing. Now, where does that fl a flood come to in our lives? Well, I will pr say that, and this is from the Bible, that a lion's share of the blessing, of the harvest that we've been talking about, that you are going to reap, you will reap in heaven. That is being stored up for you. And you may go, well, okay, that's all well and good, but what about now? Well, the good news is God also blesses you now. He gives you a foretaste of that great reward. He, and he's, this is why he loves you so much. That he doesn't want to just only save that for later. But he says, I'm also going to give you a little bit now. A little bit of blessing, and that blessing will still be so much. It'll make you so excited to see him. It'll be my uncle who can walk again. And we weren't expecting that blessing. It might be something like a tax return. It might be a long lost family member. A word of encouragement out of nowhere. Unexpected windfall. Having a health issue just suddenly disappear. I had a kid in youth group once. He had like the worst allergies I've ever seen. One year, three of them went away. We have no idea what happened. Doctors had no idea. Just three of his most severe allergies disappeared one year. God does this. He gives you a foretaste of the great reward here on earth so that you will anticipate. You will get excited. You will have this little blessing and go, this is amazing. And God will say, if you think that's amazing, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because when you come to heaven, you will reap the reward of every single thing you've done for me. Every penny you've put in that offering plate. Every day that you took out of your schedule to go spend it with somebody who needed you. Every time that you saw somebody in need and you helped them for my name's sake, you sowed in the Spirit and now reap in the Spirit. Enjoy these things forever. My kids and I have a joke that we say when we get to heaven, God's going to tally up everything you've ever done and says, okay, you've now earned 5,223 points. Here's a catalog. You can choose all your rewards. And it'll be like, you know, I, I get to fly. That's 500 points. And I get to do this. We have no idea what these, these blessings and these rewards are going to be like in heaven. But they will be a lot. And Paul says that is something to look forward to. What you do now matters, not just for this life, but for all times. So do not be weary of doing good. And when you do feel weary, get refueled again. Read the scriptures. Pray. Adjust your perspective so that you're looking at Christ and saying, I'm, it's going to be hard getting through tomorrow, but I'm going to do it with your help. And I'm going to do it because I love you and I want you to succeed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what we do matters. Our lives have purpose. We're not just living for this day or this era. Lord, we're living for you. Fill us up. Take the weak right now and make them strong. Take the, take the empty and fill them with your passion and your zeal. Lord, the scriptures tell us that your son was zealous to do ministry, zealous to bring the word to the people. We don't know if we have one day left in our life or a hundred or a thousand, but Lord, whatever we have left, may we live it for you so that we plant right seeds. And Lord, convict us of the bad seeds in our life, the things that displease you, that take us farther away from you, things that might come back to bite us one day the worst possible time, things that leave the door open for Satan to come into our life. Lord, examine our heart, as David says. Search me, know me, convict me. Help me to live for you. Lord, be with us this week. We love you. In your name, amen. In our prayers. If you would like an elder to pray for you after the service, please come up here. We'd love to be able to do that for you. But now receive the benediction from 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all. Go in the grace of God. Go do good and say yes. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right-hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash knoxepc. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.